Hello and welcome to or back to my channel. I'm Kit, your friendly feminist cat lady spinster, and today we're talking about red pill women. With my videos on Mrs. Midwest and the trad movement as a whole, it occurs to me that a lot of people still aren't familiar with the red pill and even more have no idea that red pill women are a thing. I thought it would be interesting to have a look and see if their beliefs are as bad as I imagine them to be. And well, if you're of legal drinking age in whatever country you're viewing from, I strongly recommend having an adult beverage in hand whilst watching this video. And if you're about to type out that not all red pillars believe this, let me say right here that everything I'm about to read comes from either the red pill or red pill women. Most, if not all, you're about to hear was not only posted on those subreddits, but they were also pinned to the wiki, which is required reading. Now, before we dig into the women, we should probably find out what red pillars themselves believe. I do find it interesting that the red pill is apparently for men by default, though, well, given the fundamental beliefs of the red pill philosophy, I guess I can see why they would be too sep- Actually, no, I don't know why any woman would want to be part of this. But anyway, here's a post from the red pill itself, which embodies the fundamental beliefs of the red pill philosophy. Though quite long, apparently this is not an exhaustive list. I'm not going to read each point in full, but I will link it below if you would like to. Your value is everything. You should always be improving yourself. If you're not, then you cannot compete in the world and your life will be miserable. Your diet and exercise place a certain handicap on your ability to utilize your potential. Your body is the temple that houses your mind. The red pill is about pragmatism and truth based on observation. It is not idealistic. In some ways you can say it is liberal, but it is not liberal in the idealistic pseudo-academic sense your institutions have taught you to perceive it as. Social market value is everything. Something a low value man says, which is creepy, when said by a high value man is flirty or sexy. Men are not born, they are created. Poverty, difficulty, heartache, oppression, pain, these are the things that make men out of boys. Men take more risks than women and are expected to do so. Being fearful, unconfident, and risk averse as a man leads to failure. You must be confrontational and risk taking. Single mothers typically breed boys, not men, without outside intervention. Boys do little except play Xbox and eat pizza with no direction in life. They have little luck with girls and end up, and end up drinking themselves to death smoking pot in their, in their 40s. Race does not matter if you are rich. Always set boundaries with everyone. By and into the last point, women have little sympathy for weak men, despite the fair six bullshit you may be accustomed to hearing, a man is far more likely to assist a weak man financially or emotionally than a woman is. The law prioritizes female safety and well-being over logic, honor, and justice. Feminists claim they want equality, but what they really want is power without responsibility. Women are irrational and inconsistent. They have a capacity for logic, but it is not their modus operandi. That is to say that they must exert effort to be logical it is not, as it is not their factory setting. A logical woman is easily baited to becoming emotional. Women are easy to compromise. Their decisions are based on their current emotional state rather than the abstraction of logic. Women are Machiavellian in nature. This means they are comparatively proficient at being manipulative versus the typical male. Women are hypergamous. They feel entitled to a superior mate. By and to the last point, this is why 20% of guys are fucking 80% of the chicks. Women date up, men date down. And yes, this has created a rising social inequality since women entered the professions. If a woman thinks she is better than you, she can't respect you. If she can't respect you, she can't love you. Women love men differently to the way men love women. Woman's love is based on adoration. Adoration is a concentrated amount of respect. Respect is derived from power. Be powerful if you want to be loved or you will never be loved. You will be held in contempt for being weak. Women rely on men to be emotionally stoic. We often call this holding frame. You have to be mentally strong so she can lean on you. She finds that attractive. You cannot lean on her. There is a double standard. If you lean on her, the relationship will fall apart. She will not be able to handle your problems and she will no longer find you attractive. You are a man. You have to be better than her, which means to be stronger than she is. This is why women get to be emotional and we have to be unreactive. We are strong and ignore our emotions so they can indulge in their emotions and enjoy the ride. Women are more selfish than men are in matters of money and love. Man's love is expected to be sacrificial, woman's isn't. Women love pragmatically and have no capacity to love unconditionally for romantic partners, only their children. Men can love women unconditionally. There is a hierarchy of love, men, women, children. Women have a pronounced gender group bias, which means they typically de facto side with other women in a conflict, regardless of logic or argument. Women are herd-like and sit together closely. They form cartels and use the power of the group to henpack and destroy enemies. Women have a sexual plurality. If you are a nice guy with money, you are husband to her that can nail her after 12 days that she's had so many glasses of wine, she forgets how on a primal level you're not that attractive, just cute. If you are an asshole with nice muscles, you're the guy who gets to nail her after two hours of meeting. 
Women do not care about male weakness and neither does society. If you are weak, depressed, small, poor, uneducated, unconfident, not powerful, then nobody cares. People only care about you when you're powerful or a pretty woman. Society will always have a safety net for women, white knights will charge in, the state will provide, and etc. As a man, you have no such luxury. Your propensity and ability to gain power is much higher than a woman's, but your ability to hit rock bottom is far more pronounced too. Western females are self-entitled and come from a psychological position of thinking they're better than you are. Part of the red pill is realizing her capacity for brilliance is lower than yours, which brings me on to the next point. Women need men more than men need women. Men generally want sex and perhaps a family so they have a genetic lineage to leave their worldly goods and knowledge to once they die. However, women need men for their logical minds and stoic consistency to make her emotionally stabilized, being the rock in her storm, and also need a partner just to feel complete. Just look at single mother households and all the older women who are single. They are miserable. These women need a man to be happy. Men do not need women to be happy. Men need sex to be happy. Women are depreciating assets. Their major asset and unique selling point is their sexual beauty and fertility. Most of them squander their best years on riding the cock carousel, which means fucking lots of different guys in nightclubs, having flings, being generally irresponsible, and riding through life on easy mode, getting ahead for no real talent, but because she's pretty and can give head. Women are born. Their ability to conceive children is what makes them women. So basically women are dull creatures with nothing to recommend them except fertility and sex. However, they are also devious and programmed to leap with the most valuable man they can find. And the value for a woman is in a man's income. They also do not unconditionally love said man, but also their love for a man is rooted in respect, so you have to be powerful to command that respect and thus love from a woman. But women need men more than men need women because men act as an emotional stabilizer and women need a man to feel complete and happy. But any man will do, so she doesn't truly love the man, just as money. Am I understanding that right? The following is from Red Pill Women and are the official axioms of Red Pill Women. The belief that if you want to have a good partner, you have to be a good partner. This means having some understanding of what men want in a partner, and in particular, what your man wants in a partner, and then using that information to become the best version of yourself you can be. For this reason, self-improvement and self-awareness are fundamental components of Red Pill Women. I do agree that if you want to have a good partner, you have to be a good partner. However, it's pointless to try and find out what men want in a partner. Men are not a monolith, and each will have a different answer for that question. Truth is more important than feelings, and truth is measured by results. Citation needed. The understanding that men and women have different natures and preferences. They have different strengths and weaknesses and different sexual strategies. Does that not go for everyone? The fundamental sexual marketplace transaction is women are gatekeepers of sex, men are gatekeepers of commitment. The acceptance that we are all flawed. In that umbrella, we hold the belief that many red pill terms are, are largely true about us. All women are like that, hypergamy, shit testing, etc. However, the meaning of those terms is open for debate. People are indeed flawed and you should never put anyone on a pedestal, but you really think what they say about women is true? If you believe that, how can you live with yourself? And if you believe that, how can you subject a man to it? And also, does the red pill agree that the meaning of those terms is open for debate? The idea that relationships generally work better if the man is in charge. It is a preferred relationship to both the man and the woman. This is due to the inherent dominant nature of men and submissive nature of women. The ultimate goal for a woman is a long-lasting relationship with a man whom she loves, respects, and is attracted to. Every woman ultimately bears agency for her outcome and satisfaction with life. One of her most important responsibilities is choosing a man worthy of her trust and devotion. These are the distinguishing features of red pill women that make it red pill women rather than any generic relationship subreddit. Men and women have different goals. Men want to spin plates, have casual sex, long-term relationships, marriage, children. Women want long-term relationships, marriage, children. You might notice that men and women have different goals, and if you're wondering why, it's because men are gatekeepers to commitment and women are gatekeepers to sex. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means men will nearly always want sex and have an easier time forming relationships, while women will always want a relationship with a good man, but will have an easier time finding someone to have sex with. Now, red pill women know to keep their end count as low as possible, and red pill men know they don't want to end up in a sexless anything, so everyone is behaving with a certain caution and worry. However, everyone learns pretty quick that the key to getting what you want is to withhold their strongest asset. Thus, men tease commitment to get sex, and women tease sex to get commitment. The red pill often focuses on helping men create a more developed and engaging life. Red pill women is also focused on self-improvement. However, it only applies to types of improvement that will make a woman more attractive and desirable to a man. Though they believe every woman should lead a satisfied and fulfilling life, that falls outside of the subscope. So men are allowed to have a full life, which makes sense, given that the red pill doesn't believe it's wise for a man to marry, whilst women get to worry about getting a man. 
It's great they pay lip service to women having satisfying lives as well, but if that were really true, I think that would also be something that's so focused on. It's not as though it's limited for space. According to the red pill, the nature of humans is male epiphiliac poly polygyny. If men existed in a universe where fully formed, hot 16 to 18 year old girls with long, silky hair and 0.7 hip waist ratios grew out of the ground without agency, wants, needs, and desires of their own and without families to care for and protect them, men would kill each other to collect as many of them as possible, replacing them with new ones as the older ones cycled out. Female hypergamy. If six foot, six foot two, 34 year old eye baker millionaires grew out of the ground fully formed with no agency, wants, needs, and desires of their own, and no families to look after their interests, 25 women would each chase and even consent to share the one that managed to make one million and one while keeping a weather eye on anyone who manages to make $2 more as an option for jumping ship. However, we live in a world in which we have a dynamic place within a shifting, ever changing sexual marketplace. Our market value is based on how closely we conform to the others to the other sex state of nature as possible within our bracket, and this is key. A 50-year-old poor man may want a 17-year-old hot girl, as per nature, but he generally realistically understands he isn't going to get one and shoots for the, for the most neotenous, slender, silky-haired youngest woman in his class, say a 38-year-old woman. A chubby, less than attractive 29-year-old woman may want a 6'2", 34-year-old millionaire eye banker, but if she's realistic, another can of worms, she will likely shoot for what is in her class, a shorter man, a poorer man, a man with less options. This all accounts for why many people have a hostile reaction to many core TRP beliefs. They say, but look, fat, ugly people get together all the time and form couples, as if to disprove the core sexual nature of man. Of course they do, but solely because we are all, as humans, trapped in a world delimited by our own features and viable options. Not because even the ugliest, least attractive person wouldn't gladly take the most attractive possible person, the 10, if they could get it. But they also said truth matters more than feelings, and truth is measured by results. But they've also decided that the average couples they see are secretly unhappy and looking to trade up. That's not a truth, that's an assumption. So in Red Pill worlds, everyone is settling? I was going to ask what the point was, but never mind. The point for men is sex. The point for women is commitment. The why you would want sex or commitment from someone you're settling for is beyond me. Is that really better than being single? Also, why have they decided if given the choice, women would want one man and gladly share him, and men would want multiple women? Men's value rests mostly on their ability to prove themselves, but they weren't born valuable. They started from nothing and had to constantly fight others and themselves to prove their worth. Us women understand this instinctively. Don't we chase and lust after men who can stand on their own two feet and fend us off for the lions? And don't we behave indifferently or with disgust to those who don't know how to do anything slash can't provide for us? It's highly unromantic, but that's the way it is. The author goes on to say that men are like a sword. They are forged into men and get better over time. Flowers begin as seeds, brimming with life as they shoot forth from the soil. The seed's capacity for giving life makes them instantly valuable. The time it takes for flowers to mature vary greatly, but once bloomed, they are beautiful to behold. They retain their beauty for a time, signaling to bees that they are fertile and ready for pollination. But after a while, the flower begins to wilt. Fewer and fewer bees visit it until the flower becomes so wilted that it cannot produce pollen or, nor be pollinated. Its value drops to nearly nothing, as its only use now is for fertilizing the ground to enable future flowers to bloom. First, I'd like to know that just because someone is able to give life, that doesn't mean it's viable to do so. I also object to the notion that it's the ability to have kids that makes a woman valuable. If you've been making the parallels between flowers and women in this example, you'll see that it's pretty bleak. In this sense, the odds are heavily stacked against us because we only have so much time when we are at our peak beauty to find and secure an LTR or marriage. Like it or not, men place physical attractiveness as their number one trait they look for in a mate. The fact that you have an education, career, or whatever else you think is valuable does not make you more sexually attractive. Once we're no longer beautiful, assuming you do nothing about it, our chances of finding a man drop significantly. This is why we at RPR advocate against writing the CC. You waste your good years on men who have no intention of giving you an LTR or marriage. But not all hope is lost. The difference between flowers and women is that women can take action to maintain as much of their beauty as possible, for as long as possible. Flowers can't work out, learn to cook, or be sexually available after their prime. The older you are, the harder you'll have to work to maintain your value. Looks-wise, a 45-year-old woman is never going to be able to compete with a 19-year-old. She's just not. This is where your education, career, etc. can help develop relationship market value, RMV. Once you hit the wall, a critical part of the mental calculations men do when evaluating you for marriage LTR material is what you contribute to the relationship. For example, 
Sally isn't getting any younger, but she's a damn good cook and keeps the house clean. She's good with friendly intellectual sparring about world news and events, which keeps me mentally stimulated outside of work. Melissa isn't getting any younger, but she takes good care of my kids while I'm away and prefaces our marriage first that, may, that we may set a good example for our children. Her degree in accounting is incredibly useful for good bookkeeping in our, in our home business as well as our personal finances slash taxes. So basically, you have to continually prove that you're a good investment lest you be thrown over for a younger, more attractive woman. What happened to wife goggles? Also, a 45-year-old woman isn't competing with a 19-year-old. If a man wants a teenager, a 45-year-old woman isn't on his radar. And on that note, most 19-year-olds don't want a man in his 50s or his 40s or even his 30s. And that is okay and normal. A non-traditionally minded woman decided to write about how to deprogram from the blue pill. Are you ready? Beauty is subjective. In my opinion, this is a dangerous lie in current society. Beauty is probably the most objective thing about us women. Sure, there are conventional beauty standards, but that doesn't mean everyone finds the same people attractive. And for that matter, just because someone finds you attractive doesn't mean they want to date you or that you'd even be a good couple. You are good enough. Blue pill propaganda to stop you from improving yourself. How you are now may be good, but I'm sure you can be so much better. As Red Pill women, we work on ourselves constantly without moaning how insecure we are that we are never good enough. If we don't like something, we change it. You can think you're good enough, a pretty good person, or whatever, and still want to improve yourself. We're special. Everybody is unique. If you took the Red Pill, I am sure you know that beta people love flaunting their uniqueness. As a Red Pill woman, I think it's important to understand you're not a special snowflake and you shouldn't want to be. Neon-haired girls, male feminists, and other Blue Pill groups think they're actually born for greatness. What's wrong with not conforming? And should we not all be striving for greatness? Anyway, I had a wander of the Blue Pill subreddit and on their sidebar, the Blue Pill is a satire of the Red Pill and the strategies discussed on that particular sub. I have a hunch that no one seriously says they're Blue Pill. Eating disorder, unrealistic beauty standards. Feminists are scaring young girls away from, from counting calories or eating less because OMG, anorexia skinny is dangerous. You need at least 2,500 calories or you faint. No one casually tells women to eat 2,500 calories. In fact, Product packaging is based on a 2,000 calorie diet. And while we're here, please don't take diet advice from the internet. Using eating disorders rhetoric to keep women fat and consuming is just propaganda. No, that's capitalism. Also, if you see a beautiful girl on the street with pretty face and skinny body, do not pay attention to her. She is photoshopped to promote unrealistic beauty standards. Beautiful men don't exist according to the blue pill. Note, eating disorders can be dangerous. I'm not talking about real anorexia. I'm talking about propaganda. Thanks for clearing that up. Though I'm more of a body neutrality person than body positivity, the body positivity movement doesn't advocate for telling thin women they're anorexic. That's also harmful and hurtful. And who is saying you can Photoshop someone that you're, that you're looking at in real life? Or are you talking about a picture that you walked by? By now we should all know that yes, the majority of pictures you've seen in ads are Photoshopped. Men care about personality, humor, intelligence, etc. I admit I actually really believe this and the big surprise for me when I took the red pill was actually how little value men place on all of these traits. As a woman, a man's looks are just the icing on the cake, so in true blue pill fashion, I thought men also think like this. Even if, even if I'm not interested in the red pill as a sexual strategy, it's very useful to me to acknowledge the fact that men care 99% about my looks. Men are individuals. All of them have different preferences and place importance on different things. This is why I wouldn't advise a woman to make herself attractive to men or a man to make himself attractive to women. Neither sex is a hive mind. You know that your youth and femininity are powerful assets and you will make the most of them because you know what happens when you don't. You refuse to be an old lady with the hamster still spinning telling her that she can be a great catch at any age. So women are hearing voices? Okay. Now, once you've silenced the hamster, exercised the demon, whatever, you can move on to maximizing your value. Maximizing your value as a woman comes down to your looks only. Maximizing your looks as a great LTR prospect comes down to looks plus homemaking skill and the valuable advice on this subreddit but maximizing your value as a person comes down to securing your future through your own means. Well, I'm glad she advises women to secure their future, but your only value as a woman is your looks? Really? What will you do when your looks are gone? Men often say, don't listen to what women say, watch what they do. I advise you to do the same for men. Watching what they do, I see a lot of older men with high sexual market value leaving their older wives with good homemaking skills for high SMB young women. What happened to wife goggles? But this does not surprise me because you can't talk about how men are just naturally attracted to youth and fertility and then say that, hey, so long as you marry young enough, you won't have to worry about being thrown aside for a younger model because you'll always be young in that man's eyes. Anyway, she finishes with, keeping your beauty long-term is the most red pill thing you can do as a woman. It will ensure your happiness long-term and your husband's happiness in the marriage. And I really don't see how because time will win eventually 
And if you're banking your happiness on keeping your looks, if you're so fortunate as to have a long life, you'll be miserable for a great portion of it. So I do enjoy when people give reasons for why they believe what they do. First up, why male-led relationships work better. Female attraction to dominance. Women are attracted to masculine men. So if the guy takes charge, he'll obviously be more attracted to his wife or girlfriend who will stick around longer. I really love blanket statements. We cannot deny that men have a greater instinct to protect and even rest their life for women they care about, whereas women do not have this instinct for men, even a man she loves. Men not only have a greater instinct to protect their woman's life, but also provide for her and give her a good quality of life. Men have a greater instinct to protect and will lay their lives down for women, whilst women don't feel the same urge. So then why do men murder their wives more often than women murder their husbands? I believe that males are the sex who are more willing to commit to a marriage and make it work. Two thirds of all divorces are initiated by women. I believe is not enough to substantiate this claim. I don't know how old this writer is, but she should look into reasons why women file for divorce instead of just writing it off as, oh, women don't take commitment seriously. Which is interesting since part of the red pill thing is that men want sex, women want commitment. We also have to look at patriarchal societies where men suffer less from divorce than women do, such as the Middle East. In many of these societies, a man will get the kids and only pay alimony for a short time if he divorces his wife, yet few men do so. You really want to take the Middle East as an example of male and female relations? Also, even back in the days when Western society was more patriarchal, men still chose to protect and provide for their wives, even if their wife was getting older, less attractive, and more annoying. Since men had the money and power, they could have set up a society where women were kicked to the curb once they were old, and they could freely marry younger women, but men did not do this. How generous. Are they aware that religion, and more folks religious back then, and for that matter religion influenced a lot of those old time morals, frowned upon divorce? For that matter, the government frowned on divorce as well. Women weren't allowed to provide for themselves in those days, she references, and the easiest way to ensure they were cared for was for them to remain married. And say what you like, even 100 years ago, 20 year olds weren't vying to marry 50 year old men with children their age. From another post, along similar lines, I like the saying that relationships shouldn't be 50-50, they should be 100-100, each person putting in their best effort, instead of keeping track of who did this and who did that. It just leads to frustration. Do they really think that people who believe in equal partnerships are out there writing down I hook so you to dishes and divvying things up literally half and half? That's not what an equal partnership is about. Someone wrote a post about balance, which has some interesting bits in it. There are certain core elements in which men and women are the exact same or almost exactly the same. We're both equally human with human intellect, emotions, and capabilities. I'm glad someone put that out there. But then they began talking about differences and, for example, Men and women differ in the specific types of food we like to eat and the firmness of the mattress we like to sleep on. Is she really saying that men and women like different foods based on their sex? He likes it cooler, she likes it warmer. He loves math and she loves nursing. Certain fields are dominated by men and others by women because we're different. Generalizations exist because they are true with regards to the general population even if they aren't true for every last person. And what is the benefit to making generalizations like this? You're just pigeonholing people. One of the key differences that's worth noting is this. Men tend to thrive on creating something from nothing, while women tend to thrive on maximizing the value of the existing something. Citation needed. Once upon a time, a man couldn't fry an egg or wash a shirt, and a woman couldn't hold a ham or earn a living. This has changed and that's not a bad thing. This person cannot seriously believe that men couldn't cook or women couldn't hold a hammer. Did single men just starve and wear dirty clothes? So that means that women going to the factories in the fields during World War II must not have actually happened, the idea that we ought to both cook and both work and both do the laundry and both clean the toilets all in the name of equality is not a good thing. If you need to do it this way because of necessity, that's one thing, but an ideal marriage is a partnership where I take care of one, two, and three, and you take care of four, five, and six. I take care of the things I'm best at doing, and you take care of the things that you're best at doing. So based on this, I'm going to say yes, they really do think that proponents of equal partnerships do keep score about who does what. In reality, in the name of equality means it's not a given that a woman will be doing all the household tasks simply because she's a woman. So first, we're going to learn about submissive behavior as a strategy. The author opens with, any woman with a triple digit IQ who devotes an hour or so to scanning the main red pill subreddit will, qu will quickly realize a few things. The red pill deliberately cultivates a harsh and critical tone towards women in general. The red pill deliberately teaches dealing with women in a ruthless and self-interested fashion. And any self-respecting woman would promptly exit the red pill subreddit after realizing that, but alas. The basic method of the red pill is founded on the realization that mating between men and women is governed by the balance between two corresponding instincts. 
Women instinctively submit to, defer to, and obey men. Men instinctively protect and care for women. Each of these instincts, when expressed proportionally, tends to provoke the corresponding response in the other. When these two instincts are both strongly expressed, a win-win interaction inevitably takes place. The woman is not brutalized or casually discarded despite her complete vulnerability because the man's own instinct to protect and care for her restrains him. And the man is not exploited and vampirically sucked dry because of the woman's instinct to defer to him and place his desires ahead of her own. Right. Okay. So men have an instinct to protect and care for women, but they mainly just want sex and shouldn't get married. LTR if you must. Women have an instinct to defer to men and place his desires ahead of hers, but they will jump ship when someone of higher value comes along. When we understand this, we can see the reasoning behind the tone of the red pill. It is a deliberate tactic for training men to suppress their protective instinct, necessitated by an environment full of women who are not submissive. Please feel free to put your understanding of what she's saying below, but to me it sounds like she's saying men will naturally lay their lives down for women, in general, not specific women, because of their provider and protector nature. And that's why the red pill is so harsh to protect men from themselves. If the teachers of the red pill must work as hard as they do to suppress male protectors even of women who are not submissive, how hard can it be for a woman who is to activate that same instinct? So yes, that is what she's saying. I've had experiences and I don't look at men and think they all think it would be funny to terrify a woman. But I also don't look at all men and think they would be willing to lay their lives down for mine. And you know, they don't have to. And that's okay. This is just not healthy and not safe. This, in a nutshell, is why red pill money just submissive behavior. It has nothing to do with tradition. Huh. It is not a religious law or a moral obligation. It is simply the best move for dealing with any man who isn't severely damaged. This is why drawing boundaries with your man or negotiating with him from a, from a position of strength may sound safe, but it's a very bad idea. It is a decision to engage in conflict with the sex that is built for conflict, while in the very act sacrificing an incredibly potent advocate who lives inside his own head past all his defenses. So basically, odds are he's bigger and stronger than you, so you should be as submissive as possible so as not to provoke him, and to appeal to his protective side so that never even enters his head. He doesn't see you as an equal to do battle with, he sees you as a child to be protected. This is just awful. You could be so submissive you do become a doormat, but that won't save you from someone who wants to do harm. And I'm pretty sure I say this in every video I do about submission, but power corrupts. And someone who thinks they should be deferred to based on their sex is very likely already corrupted. Moving on, they recommend bringing your problems, not solutions, because the former will be telling him what actions to take and he may become resentful of you telling him what to do. Red Pill Woman recommends leading with your emotions, which will give him the opportunity to come up with a solution on his own initiative. And this works because your man wants to protect you and men are natural problem solvers. By showing them your, vul your vulnerability and your emotions, your captain will jump into protection mode. And when he does, all you have to do is smile and give him a big hug. They also recommend something called the STFU method. What is it? This might seem like a no brainer. Just close your mouth and all will be well. It can be a little bit trickier than that. STFU also means body language. Eye rolling is not you STFUing. Gasping with exasperation is not you STFUing. Pouting is you not STFUing. When do you apply it? While reading this, you might think that STFU only applies when your SO says something that hurts your feelings. However, this applies to a variety of feelings, not just hurt ones. When you aren't getting your way, when you think you know better, when you want to control things, when you want to dominate things, when you want something done in a certain way, when you want something done now, when you don't want to do something now, when you want to hamster, when you don't want to have sex, when you feel bossed around, when things just aren't getting done and you want them done now, etc, etc, etc. Bossing, nagging, whining, bitching, complaining, griping, mothering, smothering, grumbling, belly aching are all times when you, when you need to STFU. At times, these things can be masked as coming from a good place. A gentle reminder every 10 minutes to take out the trash. A little push in the right direction because he has no clue what he is doing. A honey-do list a mile long. Sound familiar? Now go and shut the fuck up. Now, after that, you might wonder how you can make a request of your SO without being accused of bossing, nagging, or whatever. Fortunately, they do have a post titled How to Make a Request. First, identify what you want. This is your knee-jerk reaction. The thing you want or feel annoyed about or need him to do. In the writer's case, she would like her SO to throw his trash away. Most women will stop here and say, Honey, could you please start to throw your trash away? As, and as I'm sure most of you know, he nods and does it for a period of time and then falls back into old habits. Even worse are the women who haven't made their way past the sidebar. They say, Husband, throw your trash away. That is a woman who is leading their relationship. So then you have to ask yourself, what do I really want or why do I want this? This is where you stop and recognize that we have different things that are important to us. 
you may realize that your request stops here and that you handle it yourself. If his help, support, or buy-in are important to your request, then you have to know what you're actually asking for. It's too easy for me to pick up the takeout box and throw it away. Why then is it important if he leaves it out? Well, because if there's still food inside, it can spoil and begin to attract pets? Because it's really weird for your SO to leave something expecting you to throw it away when they could just easily do it themselves? Or if they can't for some reason, actually ask you to do that for them? Some women might say that it's disrespectful or that it's not right that he expects me to clean up after him or some other such nonsense. Again, it takes all of three seconds to throw out the box as I pass by. He's obviously not bothered by it being on the counter, so it's not until I have to stop what I'm doing to pick up after him. Why is it important to me that he, that he picks up after himself? What do I really want? I really want to clean up the house without having to ask him if he's done with the takeout box. I really want to throw things out without worrying about tossing something he's not done with. Okay, now we have a workable issue. In that case, why would you worry about throwing away an empty takeout box? Step three, there's steps, okay. Double check that your request is about the end result. Do I need for him to throw out the takeout box? No, it's not about how the box gets trashed. I would like to feel comfortable that it's actually trash. Then check that it's not about accusing him of doing something wrong. Am I going to complain about trash on the counter? No, because it's about my uncertainty, not the rightness or wrongness of his actions. This seems like a lot of unnecessary work about something that's not a big deal. After asking your SO if they could please throw out their trash, which really should have been taught by one's parents, if it's empty, throw it out. If it's not, put it in the fridge so it doesn't spoil. Take him your problem. Smile if possible. As some of you may have noticed, I tend to use 15 words where five will do. What I said to him was, I'm not clear if the trash on the counter is trash or something you are saving for later. If you have a solution for this, I'll implement whatever strategy you like. Otherwise, I'm assuming that stuff on the counter is trash. I should have stopped at implement whatever strategy you like, but my mouth and brain ran away with me and I'm far from perfect at this. He laughed and let me know that it was okay to throw stuff away. He might spin it around his brain and get back to me with a more thorough thought later, which he probably would have done if I didn't offer up a solution. Darn. Still, it was much smoother than it would have been if I simply demanded that he clean up after himself. Progress. He might spin it around in his brain and get back to it with a more thorough thought later. It's trash. And always remember, just because you ask, doesn't mean he has to agree or give you what you want. Accepting no with grace is also a virtue. So if the takeout box is empty, but he says it's not trash, you just let it sit on the counter to grow mold? So this next post is something. It starts off with, we are all familiar with the Red Pill notion that women don't mature past the age of 18 and women are the most mature teenagers in the room, which, Wow, I was unaware of that red pill teaching. She continues with a story about a child forced to mature because he lost his parent and had to take care of his baby brother, but despite begging, digging through trash, the brother dies. There is a reason why this fictitious story is sad, because it is forcing a child into a position of maturity when he shouldn't have to be. A child assuming a real position that an adult would normally have to assume is a sad story because you want to hold on to that youth and innocence that the child possesses. We don't want to burden him with the maturity of adulthood. This thought experiment made me realize that not only can the lack of maturity be a good thing, it's actually a gift men give us. Men want to protect us from maturity the same way society wants to protect that child from maturity. How is a lack of maturity in an adult a good thing? How many men want their wife to be another child? And are these men going to forego sex so these women can maintain their childlike innocence? As we all know, men have a natural inclination to protect us. But now I've realized that under the umbrella of protection, men also protect us from the burden of having to be mature. Reading the post above, I realize when a man chooses to be strong and push down his emotions, he does it so that we don't have to. When he becomes mature, jaded, and cynical, he does it so that we can maintain our innocence, youth, and liveliness. At the end of the day, someone has to be able to step up and deal with it when shit really goes down. Someone has to be able to put aside their fears and fight if need be. Men do this so that we don't have to. They are protecting us, not because we are the weaker sex, but because they don't want to have to burden us with that. That's what maturity actually is. It's a burden. When we, when we maintain our innocence, they feel like they've been successful because they've done their role as men to protect us. Immaturity isn't an insult, it's a gift. Men give us so much and all they ask in return is that we respect them and share that youthful vitality with them so that, once in a while, they can remember what it's like to be a kid too. There is just something off here. How can you marry, have sex, and have kids and not mature? If you view someone as innocent and want them to maintain their innocence, how can you marry, have sex, and have kids with them? Some submit for biblical reasons, others because of tradition. Red pill women submit because of fear, which makes sense. If a man came up to me and told me he was red pilled, I would be scared of him.
A user very kindly put men and women into hierarchies. This video is about ripping women, but quickly, here's a TLDR about the hierarchy of men. Prince Charming doesn't exist. Marriageable are almost perfect but have flaws. Alpha fucks can be unstable and have trouble committing. Beta orbiters aren't your first choice, and invisible men are completely unattractive. And as for the women, marriageable women. The red pill stance on marriage is simple. Don't get married. As such, one can infer that these women do not exist because if the message of the separate is to not get married, what women will be marriage material. Thus, we can conclude that the women in the uppermost echelon are unicorns, i.e. women that do not exist. These are the women you fantasize about growing up with a blue pill mentality. Hot, young, attractive, kind, does not shit test, puts food on the table every day, gets you sex whenever you want, etc. They are your hourglass virgin women who are excellent in bed. They can cook like Gordon Ramsay. They are seemingly perfect. Edit. I want to clarify something that is causing confusion in the comments. If you want to get married, good for you. The red pill's position is don't get married. Hence, I conflated unicorns with marriageable women to remind people to not get married. There are LTR-worthy women out there that are not unicorns that you can get married with, but you would still be taking a huge risk. LTR-worthy women. These women are physically attractive, to your taste at least, have a reasonable level of intelligence, have some common sense, are polite in their interactions with others, are sexually available, understand that you are the head of the house, etc. In short, they are like marriage material except they have flaws. There are one, two, three, or more flaws that they have, major and or minor, that you are willing to tolerate because they add value to your life. This is key. If they do not add value to your life, consider denoting them to the third strata of women. LTR worthy women are obtainable only if you have demonstrated to them that you have value. Such value is obtainable by maximizing your physical attractiveness, i.e. working out, making more money, or getting a job for some of you, cultivating alpha male mindset, and not being an ignorant dumbass. It takes work to get the LTR worthy woman, as a lot of them are going to want someone of quality as well. Nevertheless, understand that in an LTR, you are the prize. Make sure she is submissive and that you are the special one. So I don't think one person in a relationship should be the special one or walk around thinking that they're the prize, but given that they do, I want to ask, why? Why are men the prize? Plates. Plates are what the majority of the red pill men go after. If you work out, act confident, and learn how to gain women through emotional manipulation and deceit, read Dark Triad, <sighs> getting women to sleep with you should not be especially difficult. These are women that may or may not be LTR worthy women depending on some other traits. For example, a plate with a slutty past is not an LTR worthy woman. I have written about this topic before. However, a plate that you obtained that does not fail at some of the most important arts like LTR checks, e.g. partner count, has the potential to become LTR material if you mold her into one properly. Plates are the girls you hook up with on Tinder. They are the ones you easily pick up at a subway. They are not the girls that sleep with you on your first date. They are not the one who bitch and shit tests you to the point where you'd rather be alone or with your buddies. They are not the ones that bug you constantly when you're out and about asking where you are. As an aside, if any of this happens, consider employing dread game quickly. Plates can be easily denoted into the fourth strata of women if you determine that a plate is unworthy of effort. Remember, to acquire a plate, you need game, you need to lift, you still need to make the first move on Tinder. You still, need, you still put in some effort. But what if the plate isn't even worth that much effort? Maybe she's only a six. Maybe she's an eight, but she should test you every damn day. What then? Then you should demote them. Right. Hot take. Women should avoid men who talk about them as though they're objects, instead of trying to find ways to appeal to his natural male protectiveness. Also, mold her? But it gets worse. Dumpsters. Dumpsters are basically sluts. Now, don't misunderstand me. Plates can be sluts too. In fact, I've heard of college men dumpsters simply because the language is more colorful and humorous. Hilarious. A dumpster is a form of plate that you have pressed under your thumb. You do not go out of your way at all to get sex from this woman. This woman sticks around because for attracting to you that you have instilled in her by making her believe that you are someone she needs in her life. Getting a dumpster is difficult. The easiest way to acquire one is to first acquire a plate and then demote her. In order to keep around a former plate as a dumpster, you need to convince someone that she has a chance at a relationship with you. Do whatever you want to do so. Lie, cheat, steal, the red pill is immoral. I'm telling you that these immoral actions that you can perform still work. Hell, gaslight them if you want to. Dumpsters are not women you cohabitate with. They are not women you waste time and money on. They make themselves sexually available to you at almost all times because of her attraction to you that you can bolster through manipulating her. Getting a dumpster requires you to be on top of your game as it relies on you putting in nothing to the relationship and her putting in everything. She needs to feel on edge for her to be a dumpster. You cannot give her any sense of security. A lot of women, yes a lot, will object to this. Sadly, they are not stupid enough to realize they are being used, so a lot of women will abandon you if you treat them like a dumpster because they want plate status back. It is up to you if you want to remote them to plate status or not. Let me further clarify the differences between a dumpster and a plate. A plate is a woman who spreads her legs for you because you texted her, come over now. A dumpster is a woman who spreads her legs for you because she came to your residence out of her own volition because she believes that she needs to have sex with you for you to keep her around. 
A plate cooks a meal for you because you told her, I want steak tonight. A dumpster cooks for you because she is so attracted to you she wants to keep you happy. A plate is a woman you want in your life, for sex primarily. A dumpster is a woman who you don't give a fuck about whether she's in your life or not. If you are not disgusted by a CD, fuck her, otherwise demote her. But perhaps the biggest difference is that plates commit to you, while a dumpster, true to her name, fills her holes with the cum of many guys and is incapable of commitment. They have no self-control at all. Remember that British girl who back in July received international attention for sucking off 24 guys at a bar? She's a dumpster. She is so mentally damaged that she cannot be anything more than a plate at most. You call her mentally damaged, and yet you will take advantage of her. Dumpsters are your former sluts turned single mothers that genuinely think they have a chance with you and give you sex whenever you ask because it is the one thing they know how to do. This is linked on the Red Pill Women subreddit. I don't understand how any self-respecting woman can read this and think, yes, I should do my best to show these men that I'm worthy. I'm not a plate or a dumpster. I'm worthy of commitment. The men that act this way, that believe these things, are trash and are unworthy of even a conversation. The untouchables. There are women out there, the fours and lower, the obese women, the feminists, the SJW, I'm not saying that word, the writers at Jezebel, the Tumblrinas, the other kin, the transgenders that are not worth your time. An untouchable woman is one who is, in no way, shape, form, or manner, of a high enough status to have sex with you. Remember, you are the prize. You have standards. You decide who you want to sleep with. If you meet an eight and she is a feminist blab blabbering on and on about how she only sleeps with white athletes over six feet tall, then be my guest and fuck her. But if you meet a four and she is a feminist blabbering on and on about how she only sleeps with white athletes over six feet tall, you should not give her the time of day. Why? One, she's a four. Two, she's a feminist. Three, her hypergamy is unchecked. Untouchables need to understand that there are some men they cannot get, and you need to understand that there are better women you can get. It is quite easy to distinguish untouchables from, from dumpsters. If you meet a woman that is slutty but easily manipulated, she is a dumpster. If she is hot but vapid, she is a dumpster. If she is a one-night stand, she is a dumpster. If she is so unattractive that you don't want to fuck her and would instead enjoy a pint in the billiards room with your mates, she is an untouchable. I feel confident in speaking for all of the above that we'd rather you not touch us, and anyone who thinks this way is no prize. Not as a friend, and certainly not as a partner. No wonder they need to manipulate women, though ironically they claim that women are natural manipulators. Someone decided to ask the men lurking around Red Pill Women what men want. And, well, if I wasn't disgusted before, men do have broken toy syndrome. Give it away too easy, and we are suddenly sitting there with this thing we thought we really wanted but are totally disgusted by. Related to sex, what will make me next a woman? A lot of things, honestly. My current LTR has always, always done with me whatever sexual fantasies or desires I've had from the moment she was a plate on. I would love to know if she knows that she was ever a plate. We've done threesomes, anal, weird fantasies, roleplay, etc. Never been turned down, never heard anything to the tone of, I am too pure for that. And no, she's not some slut. Her end count I've recently well verified and it's low single digits. But she's super into me, so she'll do anything. In my opinion, if a girl isn't willing to at least try something I'm into, she probably isn't that into me. Doing anything with another guy in your past that you won't do with me is also a huge no. Once you've done it for someone else, you're doing it for the guy who wants to invest his time and resources in you, no exceptions. I don't know who needs to hear this, but just because you've done something before, sex on the first date, anal, whatever, you're under no obligation to do it again, either with the same person or with someone else. If you're still a virgin, you have the moral authority to demand long-term commitment before any kind of sexual contact occurs. Remember, women are the gatekeepers of sex and your SMV drops with each new sexual partner. Your RMV drops even further. This is especially true for the first few partners. You're the gatekeeper and you want a quality man. Don't let just anyone through the gates. So if you're not a virgin, you have no moral authority to demand commitment before having sex. But for every man you sleep with, your sexual and relationship market value declines. But you have no moral authority to ask for commitment before having sex if you're not a virgin. But if you don't have sex soon enough, you'll be passed over for someone who will. There is, there is no way to win at this game. For me, I want sex as soon as possible. I can see a girl and know almost immediately if I want to have sex with her. So if we have sex within a few hours of meeting, I'm happy. However, if I have sex that quickly with a girl, I lose interest in them very fast. I have no desire to date them. So Red Bull one advises not to delay looking for a husband. They don't seem to be as strict about the wall as some of the men I get commenting around here are, and they say women still have worth afterwards, but a couple things stuck out to me. What if you've hit the wall and you're still single? There's still hope for you. You can still find a man. He just won't be as high a caliber as you could have sent if you were 20. You aren't doomed to a life alone or a life of unattractive schlubs and bad sex. You still have worth. I think that is something a lot of women feel is that after the wall they are worthless. Not true. There are men who don't want children or who have children from previous marriages and don't want more. Your fertility won't matter to them. Maybe we'll be an older man. 
My dad is 59. His girlfriend is 20 years younger than him, but is still over the wall. So your choices dwindle to men who don't want children? What if you do? The decline of fertility is gradual. It doesn't suddenly drop off a cliff at 30. Married women who are happily so will benefit from wife goggles, which is a term that means your husband's love blinds him to how his wife is aging and he still sees her as, it, as in her youth. You want those wife goggles firmly in place prior to the wall. That explains why I get these same men telling me that provided a woman marries when in her prime, she'll keep her husband even once old and infertile. But as seen in previous writings, that's not true. The wife goggles are not really a thing. So I found a post from the mod of the Red Pill and Red Pill Women, which says, I will succinctly state what the ECs generally agree upon to be the Red Pill position on the matter. When a girl says she was raped, there are two possibilities. One is that she was, and the second is that she is lying. If she indeed was, she is damaged goods. She will not be sexually open with you like girls that have not been raped. If you ever make her feel uncomfortable in the bedroom, she will play the rape card and there's nothing you can do. If she is lying, she either made a false rape claim in which she generally believes she was raped, but actually just regrets having sex, or she is crazy. Both are dangerous behaviors that can endanger your life. The solution is to break up with such women. Do not date or plate. And women want to align themselves with these beliefs because... I also found this gem over there. When a woman has a high partner count, a man asks himself, none of them kept her, why should I? So if a woman has a high partner count, he begins thinking she might not be worth it since none of the other men wanted to keep her. It being impossible, of course, that she didn't seek a relationship with them or they did have a relationship that ended amicably. When a woman delays, withholds, and asks for promises or time, a man says, she is cool head enough about me to negotiate, to enforce a policy. She regards sex me as a price to pay for what she wants, not a joy she urgently desires. So she can't have a high partner count, however many that may be, but she also can't ask for time or promises because that indicates she's not passionate enough about this man. In fact, if a woman delays sex to avoid risk to her partner count because a low count makes her more attractive, just who is this low count making her more attractive to? It makes her more attractive to other men. It does nothing for him. He, of course, expects her to increase her count by one because he wishes to be that one. If she hedges, then she is saying to him, I don't want to risk being less sexy or less coming more than to the next guy. This is BS. You can't tell women that you want them to have few sex partners and then expect them to eagerly jump into bed with you. Especially if you tell women what they need for men is commitment and the way to get commitment is, is sex and he hasn't yet committed, therefore he doesn't get sex. So basically, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Truthfully, looking at the Red Pill Reddit, I can see how that would lead to a hatred of women. However, I wanted to get the thoughts of people who had actually believed in it so I asked former Red Pillars if they had hated women. Here are their responses. Men want sex, women want commitment, though also men are protective and willing to lay their lives down for women. 
and women will happily hypergamy themselves as someone who makes two dollars more than the current mate. But it's men who want sex and women who want commitment. Men are better than women. They're logical, have a higher capacity for brilliance, and are able to love unconditionally. Women, however, are emotional and they love the wallet, not the man. However, they want commitment. They also need a man to feel complete and happy and to help regulate those unruly emotions. I was going to ask how you could bring two people together who seem to have so little in common, but of course, submission. The man's word is law and the woman submits. It doesn't matter if they agree. With the toxicity spilling out of the red pillars, I knew it was bad, but somehow it was even worse than I thought. It's not that they think women are just plain bad. They don't even think we're people. Granted, they don't give men much room for humanity either, they seem keen to reduce everyone down to our most basic animal instincts. But in addition to thinking that women are subhuman, we're also assigned all the worst traits. Although, ironically, they're also essentially advocating for men to be sociopaths. No good thing was said about women, and the only thing you can want a woman for is sex. I really don't understand how someone can read all this and decide that these emotionally bankrupt men will be great partners. Captain whatever. They said it themselves, the red pill is immoral. It's fine to lie, cheat, gaslight. So what are you doing? Why are you trying to find ways to make these men happy? And given how the red pill views women, how can you trust one of these men enough to submit to him? All right, and that was it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it as much as possible considering the content. And I'm sorry if I sound a little stuffed up at times. I am still apparently recovering from the cold that I was battling for two weeks. Anyway, have a great day. Oh. <laughs> anyway, have a great day and I will see you next week. Bye.